Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we again return to our study in Judges 8, shall we ask for our Heavenly Father's guidance so that we might be able to understand the examples and the symbols that are being presented before us for our time today. Shall we pray? <laughs> Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together again. We ask, Father, for your blessing and for your direction. Help us to understand that which we are reading. Help us to understand the symbols that we are seeing. May we be able to piece this together according to that which you would have us to do. May your guidance be with us. May your spirit attend us. May your angels be with us each one help us today so that we may become clear in that which we are seeing direct us so that we may be able to explain these symbols to all those that, with whom we come in contact we thank you father for this opportunity and this time together. As we come before you now, please direct us for this. We thank you for this. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Where we left off yesterday, We were in the portion here where the men of Israel had said unto Gideon, rule over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also. For thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. So the men of Israel are coming to one from the tribe of Manasseh, of the half-tribe. And they are saying, rule over us for three generations, yours, your son, and your son's son. Now, of course, we can note that neither Saul nor David truly ruled over united Israel for three generations. But why would these men of Israel come to Gideon with such an offer? Especially given the fact that the men of Sukkoth and the men of Penuel had refused at a time to assist Gideon in his conquest of the Midianites. Isn't it interesting that they were so willing at this point with Gideon to abandon God as their king and to seek a, let's say, a visible king in front of them, rather than recognizing the blessings of having our Heavenly Father as their leader? Okay, well, this is human nature, um, which I think we would all understand. It's, it's easier because to follow God is a cross. It requires um, a different type of faith than trusting in man because, you know, we both call them faith. Mm -hmm. Trust in man, it's, it's a type of faith. But it's a different type of faith. Um. Uh, 
when we trust in man, when we look to man, we can sort of feel um, a good about ourselves. I don't know really how to explain it, but um, when we trust in God, we become naked in his sight. We become, um, there's nothing flattering about being a Christian. It's not an easy road. And so, you know, water tends to run downhill. And that's how we are as human beings. We take the easy path. And um, it, it seems illogical when you look at it from the perspective of God's word. But there is a type of logic that people have. An example of this would be, um, there's a guy who used to work for us at the guitar store. And he was from Ontario. My guitar store is in Alberta. So Albertans and Ontario's, Ontarians, whatever you want to call them, people from Ontario are quite different in that he liked the idea that the government could take care of us and make decisions for us. He felt that they knew better than he did on the decisions in his own life. And, and I think that's how often when you look at cults and when you look at a lot of the choices people make, they would rather somebody else make those decisions and take the responsibilities than having to take that personal responsibility yourself. And what God offers us is something that's quite difficult for human nature. I don't know if that's the best way to illustrate it, but it's, it's, there's at least a parallel there. In situations like this, the adversary had decried that God's ruling, that his administration over the universe was unfair, that there would be greater freedom under his rule than under the creators. Now, here's Gideon. He's helping to reestablish the freedom of at least this portion of the nation of Israel. And many of these men in this area didn't understand the beauty of, of true freedom. They chose servitude to another, to a visible person, rather than accepting that God had their best interest in heart. So, well, it takes away individual responsibility, right? Right. Where following God doesn't take away individual responsibility. You know, it, it places it right where it should be. Mm -hmm. Too many people are scared of their responsibility. Mm -hmm. It's um, for me, it's also another microcosm of some of the things that we're seeing occurring currently within this country people don't want to take responsibility for their actions mm -hmm. they would rather have someone else make the decision so that they could avoid the responsibility for their actions and believe that they are free. We're seeing this a lot within other churches. We see this quite a bit within the corporate church. 
So we have questions that we need to be able to ask ourselves, that we need to answer for ourselves. Are we willing to accept the responsibility for our actions and their implication in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. So isn't that really the decision that we have to come to whether we are going to come to accept what we have done when we come to the foot of the cross. Is that our actions have separated us from God? Mm -hmm. Now Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. He's being very direct. But he's saying something to them that they don't like. And Gideon, Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you that ye would give me every man the earrings of his prey. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. We got into a bit of a discussion about this with Ishmael, Midian, and the children of the East. Now, who was Midian? Well, he was a descendant of, um, of uh, Abraham through uh, Keturah. Okay. So we're, it is this phrase that they were Ishmaelites, is this symbolic or is this literal? Well, it's, it's, um, well, it's not literal. That is, they're not descendants of Ishmael, but they are descendants of, of Abraham through someone that's not Sarah. Okay. So I think in that sense, that's why they're called Ishmaelites. And the people answered, and they answered, we will willingly give them. And they spread a garment and did cast therein every man the earrings of his prey. So here they were willing to give up the earrings of their prey. We're not talking here yet about, their, about the chains. We're not talking about other gold. Mm -hmm. We're talking just about the earrings. So the earrings that were worn by these Midianites helped to identify them that they were separated and not truly of the children of Israel. Now, I grew up at a time where you did not see a lot of men with earrings. Those that you did see, I mean, usually it, it had some kind of a meaning, whether it was a symbolism or whatever. Now it's, it's fairly common that you will find that there are men that are wearing earrings, whether they are studs in the ear or whether they are wearing actual earrings i've never gotten used to this so when i'm i'm reading something like this i always have to shake my head that the children of israel would take this gold 
from their prey. Then we have the result of Gideon's request. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand and seven hundred shekels of gold, besides ornaments and collars and purple raiment that were on the kings of Midian, beside the chains that were about their camels' necks. Now, collars is one translation, an alternate is sweet jewels. Now, before we began the study, Theodore was saying that it's difficult to understand the measurements at that point and to pinpoint this. Where if we were to use 11 grams as a unit of measure, that 1,700 shekels of gold could mean 187, was it 187,000 Eight, grams? 18,700 grams. 18,700 grams. Now, 18,700 grams would be how many pounds? Um... Well, how many pounds are there? How many grams are there to a pound? Well, there, there's a there's a couple of different ways of looking at the pound where you're where you're dealing with gold. That's why I know. Sure. I know. That's why I'm asking. Okay. So, if we talk about a pound of gold. I mean, are the ounces different? That's I've never really understood that. I believe that that instead of sixteen ounces, there's fourteen ounces. Yeah, but are they the same ounce? Yes. Like, okay. Um, well, they say here fourteen point five eight ounces for a pound of gold. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so those are ounces, but we're dealing with grams here. Right. Right. So I don't know. It's too many calculations I have to do. Well, I'm figuring it out here, but. Uh... Okay, a troy ounce, which is what they normally use to address, you know, precious metals like gold, is supposed to be 31.10348 grams. Yeah. Yeah, so, so then you'd have 601 point two ounces, 0. 0.22, 601.22 ounces. I mean, if you divided that by 14, you would have, so I mean, it, it anyway, it, it's somewhere over 40 pounds, you know, 43 pounds, something like that. Okay. Just as a as an idea, 43, 43 pounds would be something coming close to about the weight of a 
of about a five gallon drum in my in my history in the way that i would look at something so gallon drum of water drum yes or or of say of a a, a cleanser okay so you're looking at at something that would be considered you know quite a bit but something toward the heavy side mm -hmm. Well, it's less than a bale of hay. Oh, very definitely that. <laughs> Not many of us would be would look to wear a bale of hay, though. Right? Yeah, yeah I've I just pitched lots of bales of hay, so they're anywhere around 70 pounds, something like that. Sure. Well, the reason I was I was asking the question goes back here to Judges 827. And Gideon made an ephod thereof and put it in his city, even in Ophrah. And all Israel went thither a whoring after it, which thing became a snare unto Gideon and unto his house. <clears throat> Gideon wanted a visible symbol of communication with God. Mm -hmm. Because isn't, isn't that why the priest would wear an ephod? Mm-hmm. So it's for for me, it's a symbol that Gideon understood the instructions given to Moses that the priest was to have access to the ephod. So is Gideon now setting himself up instead of as a king, setting himself up as a priest through the construction of this ephod? Seems like that. That's what he's doing. Yet Gideon was not of the tribe of Levi. Mm -hmm. So... What else is he doing here? Is he taking some type of a, is he setting himself up as some kind of an arbiter of law before the people? Because isn't that what the priest was also doing? Mm -hmm. Well, Ellen White says uh, in page uh, 555 on Patriarchs and Prophets, because he had been commanded to offer sacrifice upon the rock where the angel appeared to him, Gideon concluded that he had been appointed to officiate as a priest. Without waiting for the divine sanction, he determined to provide a suitable place and to institute a system of worship similar to that carried on at the tabernacle. With the strong popular feeling in, favor, in his favor, he found no difficulty in carrying out his plan. At his request, all the earrings of gold taken from the Midianites were given him as his share of the spoil. The people also collected many other costly materials, together with richly adorned garments of the princes of Midian. From the material thus furnished, Gideon constructed an ephod and a breastplate. In imitation of those worn by the high priest, his course proved a snare to himself and his family as well as to Israel. The unauthorized worship led many of the people finally to forsake the Lord altogether, to serve idols. After Gideon's death, great numbers, among whom were his own family, joined in this apostasy. The people were led away from God by the very man who had once overthrown their idolatry. Now, What kind of an example are, there, are we then seeing of these decisions that Gideon had made and the result of these decisions upon not only his family, his house, and upon this portion of Israel? 
Mrs. White's being very clear, rather than keeping the people's attention focused upon God. Gideon focused them more upon idolatry. Now, it was not upon Baal so much as it was as taking worship from God to something that was not God. Now, am I off in, in the way I'm approaching this? Well, I don't think you're, you're off at all. Uh, just, you know, we've made the application to, to our movement at the present time. Right. And, and the way that I look at it is, you know, I don't believe that this movement is to organize into some kind of church or anything like that. Um, uh, I think it has been, I don't know if the word mistake is quite the right word, but um, the position that we've taken in regard to the role of the movement is almost, and, and sometimes quite explicitly, uh, replacing the church, um, which I don't think it is. That is, we're not just to have another organization um, replacing the church. Our role, our ministry is to Seventh-day Adventists because we are Seventh-day Adventists. We're not some other denomination. We're not an offshoot. And the, the spirit or the idea that somehow, you know, the church is bad and we are good I think that that is such a dangerous idea uh, because we know the church is bad, but so are we. We're no different than the people that we criticize. We have the same spirit. We have the same attitude. And in some ways we're worse because we have greater light. And yet we, we act the same way as those who don't have as great light. So, then you know the movement tends to want to isolate itself from the church and but there's also the danger of just going back to the church and just treating you know the organization as if it's controlled by god god is calling each of us individually to follow him to understand the truth for ourselves and then to be ministers to anyone who is interested in hearing truth. That's our work. And when we look at the situation with Gideon, I see this error of the ephod as very much of a parallel to what we see happening within the movement. That is, having our own, own sort of may not be officially an organization, but our own sort of fellowship that is isolated from, from the true worship that God has set up. I don't know if that people understand what I'm saying, or maybe people disagree. What you're, what really the, the manner in which you're approaching this, It stands against the idea that many have that as long as you are members of the organized church, that your salvation is assured. Yeah, but do we, we also have the corollary, the opposite of that. Corollary, yeah. Yeah, corollary. Yeah, which is, you know, people think that in order to be saved, you have to be separated from the church. And I don't think it's either or. I mean, I think that's a false dichotomy there. I think the reality is we need to be connected to Christ. And we have to do the work that he asks us to do. And it's just that human nature 
wants to see itself as good and to see right. to compare itself with others. And that spirit exists in this movement. It exists in the church. It's it's the fatal flaw that Adventists have. And and we we have that same flaw. We judge other people while we do the same things. And and that to me is what this danger that we see with Gideon. It's it's exchanging one error for actually really the same error, just in a different guise. Right. It's a, it's kind of exchanging one destructive tendency for another just because they are dressed differently. We need to come to an understanding of our need to to become more like Christ because it's only within his righteousness that we can stand before him and before the unfallen worlds. Thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel so that they lifted up their heads no more. And the country was in quietness 40 years in the days of Gideon. It's interesting that this time period, this 40 years, was in the life of Gideon, but also while Gideon himself was leading his house and his people into a, a version of idolatry. Now, I was asked a question by a sister within the movement regarding these different 40-year and 80-year periods <clears throat> that we have been examining with the different judges. Now, I shared with her some of the charts that Stephen had produced regarding Job, regarding David, regarding, you know, all these different 40 and, and so on year periods. Those charts for me were really interesting as to how they showed different periods that are important within the movement. Can these time periods that we've been seeing with Othniel, with Ahud, with Gideon, can they also be applied in different ways within the movement? Well, I think we kind of have done that. Have we done it in in the way that Stephen has done with those other charts? Well, well, I think Stephen already has done it in in the charts to some degree. I mean. We're not we're not lining up this forty years as this period within the movement. I guess if that's what you're saying in very specific ways. I am. Um, but we can see that different different um, uh, messages line up with these, right? Because these are the different enemies that that have to be attacked. So, you know, they're the enemies that are left there to test us. So I think we're we're partly doing that. Just you know, we haven't worked it all out yet. Okay. Now, as we continue to follow this, we now come to the next subject break. And Jerubal, son of Joash went and dwelt in his own house. So that's Gideon. Correct. So why would they make the delineation of Gideon in one verse and then shift back to Jerubal in the next verse? 
and then back to Gideon. I don't know. What symbol can we can we take from this? Well, is it a name change? Is that what you're saying? It's not really a name change because we know his name right at the beginning. He's called both. Right. Not renamed ever. He just has these two names. Who was it that gave him this name of Jerubal? Hmm. Well. Was it not his father? Yeah, it would have been just a name he was given, but Gideon is kind of like his nickname, I guess. Well, no, what I, I guess the point that I'm getting at, who gave him the name Gideon? I don't know. Did, did the people call him Gideon? Well, I'm asking the question, if it was not his father that was giving him first his name as Gideon, just as Enoch named his son Methuselah. And then did he not stand before the people when they sought Gideon's demise and call him Jerubal as an example of let Baal contend, let him fight for himself? Was he then given that name? But that's what I'm not sure. I guess I'm, I'm asking the question for us to consider this. <clears throat> Was his father placing this name, this description, before the other members of the tribe of Manasseh to give them an example of saying, let Baal, let this supposed Lord contend for himself against my son. It's not your responsibility to battle him. It's not your responsibility to battle my son. It is your responsibility to decide for yourself who is fighting on your behalf. Okay, so it says in Judges 6.32, Therefore on that day they he called him Jerubbaal, saying, right. let Baal plead. So that, that is, he does get that name given to him. Um, so it is a name change in Judges 6.32. So... So his dad names him that there. So his, his father is named in that. He, his father has named him twice. Yeah. Now, normally <clears throat> we look at a change of name as a covenant relationship or entering into a covenant relationship. Mm-hmm. But what is it saying about Gideon, the name Gideon, if he's now entering into a covenant with Baal? Well, how's he entering into a covenant with Baal? I mean, his father is making the name change. Yeah, but he's not entering into a covenant with Baal. So in other words, this name change is not entering into a covenant well it's not with Baal. at least i don't take it that way then who is he entering into a covenant with well it's a covenant against Baal, isn't it isn't that what we're trying to determine right now well, i think he's it's he's he's contending against Baal. I mean, his name means Baal will contend, but the idea is that, that there's this contention going on. I mean, maybe I don't understand the story quite, even though we've gone through it a few times. 
because he's going to destroy the altar of Baal, so he can't be going into a covenant with Baal. But isn't that what he ultimately winds up doing by the construction of this ephod? Because any worship that is not directed to God is against God. Well, that's true, but I don't know if, if that's that would I still don't think that would in chapter six he's making a covenant with Baal. Okay. Right. Even if his name now takes on a different meaning here. But because his covenant would be in in uh, opposed to Baal. All right. Agreed. But doesn't it by the construction of this ephod and and what was yeah. just read from this from mrs white does it not accomplish exactly the opposite of what gideon originally at least uh, yeah that's what i'm saying it would be, end up being the opposite right because in verse 33 it says uh, they went to whoring after balaam and made baal bareth their god well bareth means co covenant right so that is a covenant of Baal. So there is a covenant made with Baal there in Judges chapter 8. By making this uh, ephod, it ends right. up leading in that direction. And Baal Bereth is going to come up as, as being very important as we get further into Judges chapter 9. So, yeah. So, Jerubal, the son of Joash, went and dwelt in his own house. And now we switch again. And Gideon had three score and ten sons of his body begotten, for he had many wives. Yeah. Now, just going back to house. Right. Now, the word house, we often think, well, that just refers to his home. And, and it could mean that. Um, but house can also refer to a temple. Is it referring to a temple, though, or is it referring to a people? Well, could be referring to a people, too. I'm just saying that it could be referring to a temple. Okay. Now, why for a temple? Well, just that's what the word can mean. And if he's making this ephod, right, he's had this ephod, it could refer to, I'm not saying it does, I'm just saying it could refer to that. Um, because the word dwelt in his own house, it actually means to sit down specifically as judge. All right. So it could mean that he is now set, using this ephod and setting himself up as a judge in his own temple. I mean, that's what the verse could mean. I'm just I'm not sure that that's what it means, but it could mean that. All right. As, as we're looking at this, of course, the, the phrase, and dwelt in his own house, Would we dwell in the temple of God? But that's what I'm saying is that the word does not, the word dwell means to sit as a judge. Okay. Right. That's the primary meaning of that word dwelled. Okay. So that's, that's, that's why I'm making that. Because it means to sit down specifically as judge. Okay. But, you know, it can mean, you know, by implication to dwell, to remain, causatively to settle, to marry. So it can mean other things, um, but properly, it means to sit down specifically as judge. 
your shop. So I'm just saying that that's a possibility of the meaning based upon the context. But it also could be that he's dwelling in his house, that his house is including his whole um, role. But, you know, it's going to say that he, it's going to talk about his family as well. So it's hard to say. I'm just saying that symbolically, at least, it it's implying that there is this sort of judgment going on. That it's taking upon the role which he shouldn't have. That is the role of the priest. Right. Okay. Is there anything else we can unpack from this from this particular verse? Anything else we should look at here? I think it's interesting because I, you know, in, in the way in which you just presented this, I never would have considered this looking at it as being where dwelt was to sit as a judge, mm -hmm. especially in the way that the English is translated here. Mm -hmm. And Gideon had three score and ten sons of his body begot, for he had many wives. Here is a man with 70 sons. <laughs> 70 sons of his wives. Was he at this point following God's order in having many wives? No. On top of this, the following verse, and his concubine that was in Shechem, she also bare him a son whose name was called or was set as Abimelech. So here you have 70 and 1. Now, We know that Christ had 12 disciples, and of whom one had a devil. Yet, did he also not have 70 other disciples that he sent out? Mm hmm so in this in this description of 70 and 1 are we prefiguring some of the disciples that had followed Christ and the one Judas of Iscariot that was truly not of Christ How else can we apply these as figures with some of the things that we've seen? Well, I mean, the seven is obviously a symbol. So, um, I don't know how, how to apply it, though, in this case. Like many other examples within the Bible, I find it interesting that the sons are recorded, but the daughters are not. Uh -huh. I mean, Gideon would have been considered a very 
shall we say, a, a very rich man, not mm -hmm. only because of the, the gold earrings that he used to form this ephod, but also because of how many sons he had from his various wives. But yet, I was wondering whether the 70 could be parallel with Isaiah 23 15, because it says it shall come to pass in that day that Tyre shall be forgotten 70 years, according to the days of one king. After the end of 70 years, shall Tyre sing as a harlot. Yes, Does this have anything to do with papacy, I mean, papacy resurging? I mean, it is false worship, definitely. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know either, but there you've got the false false worship there, and you've got the seventy. You've got well, the, a real departure. God. Yeah, yeah. So the seventy years, the days of one king, would be the United States. So there could be a parallel there to some degree. But, it, but we're applying it to this movement. We're not applying it to uh, to the bigger scheme of things. How do we apply? Well, I do, I, as I said in chat, I missed most of your talk, but I definitely agree with what I did here. And there is a danger of putting our focus on any ma man, any leader, be it Maimon Wilson or Colin or you or whoever, mm -hmm. and departing from God. Right, because we can't, we can't put the movement in the place of God. We can't put people in the movement in the place of God. Uh, because each of us as individuals are to be studying for ourselves. There, there is no authority uh, placed upon man. That is, none of us are an authority. None of us should be also looking to assume the authority. Mm-hmm. And oh yeah, because the book that came to me was John six fifteen, where Christ actually departed and hid himself when the people, after he fed the five thousand, wanted to make him a king. They wanted a secular king. See, I always look at organization as a failure. That is, you know, the Adventist Church organized under God's direction in eighteen sixty three because it had failed in its mission. Correct? Agreed. Uh, no, very much agreed. Yeah. It's also interesting that this fit, this rec, they didn't really recognize the failure in their mission, but as we're recognizing it, this came seven years after um, the articles the articles had been published. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, you know, and when the movement, when Tabo and Parminder and that were planning to, you know, create this new organization, to me that didn't make sense because I would see that as a failure. And they would say the movement doesn't make any mistakes, but organization would have been a mistake. It would, it would actually be... Uh, accepting that the movement had failed is the way that I understood it. Right. You know, maybe I'm just a guy who's anti-organization, but I, I just don't see that organization ever brings about the what God talks about that happens at the end, where it appears that he has taken the work into his own hands. Once we organize, we basically tie God's hands. To say that the movement or anything is flawless, that sounds so papal. Here you have papal infallibility. Holy Mother Church never sins, never fails. Yeah, but this is what Parminder and Tabo were teaching prior to, uh, you know, their ultimate apostasy to the division that occurred. And they were teaching this uh, in 2018. So if, if there was, you know, an issue that was sort of um, 
because somebody had asked me about Dwayne Dewey leaving the movement and, you know, was it a doctrinal issue? And I don't think it really was a doctrinal issue, at least not with Jeff, but it was with Parminder. That is, Parminder and Tabel were teaching that the movement does not sin and they were teaching a, uh, that this is the church triumphant and that there would be no tares among the wheat. Um, and we know that that doesn't exist yet. It's pretty obvious it didn't exist then, and it still doesn't exist. But, you know, God isn't looking for a pure church as an organization. He's looking for, a, for individuals who connect with Christ. So when he has a bride that's a pure church, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, his bride... It's not because it's some organization managed to uh, cleanse uh, all the members. It's because there are those who are going to be Christ-like in character. And I, I think one of the reasons why the church opposes what they call last generation theology is it actually eliminates the role of the church in that respect. Right, because the church likes to believe that it's going to carry through to the end and you know that people are going to be looking to the Seventh day Adventist church, but they're not going to see a church. They're going to see Christ manifest in his people, Christ's character perfectly reproduced in his people. And they're going to hate that group of people, those individuals, because this is after the close of probation that we see Christ's character perfectly reproduced in his people. So the church has nothing to do with it as an organization when Christ comes. He's not coming to save a group of people who are all part of the Seventh-day Adventist church organization. He's coming to save those that are connected with him. And uh, But human nature wants to to have some some shortcut, some way of getting saved. They want the golden ticket or whatever it is uh, that's going to guarantee them salvation. But they don't want the cross. But that's all Christ offers us. Amen and amen. So, in this section, we're seeing that Gideon, again, had chosen of his own desires. Not only did he have many wives, but now he has a concubine. Why is it important that the concubine was in Shechem rather than being in Ophrah? What can we see there? Um, I don't know. So, well, I mean, this isn't in Oprah, so it's not his hometown. Right, that's what I'm saying. It's a division from his hometown. So it's some concubine in Shechem. Hmm. I've never thought about it before. Well, there has to be a reason that our Heavenly Father has allowed this in Scripture. Uh, Is he trying to hide something by having this concubine in Ophrah? In Shechem, you mean? It, yes, sorry. Yeah. Away from Ophra.
I mean, Ofra may mean have something to do with the color. It may have to do with a female fawn. Shechem meaning a ridge. I think of the ridge, I think of the, the example when Christ <clears throat> cast out demons and they sought to go into that herd of pigs and the herd of pigs basically jumped off a cliff. So whenever I'm, I'm looking at a ridge, I'm having to also think of a cliff. Yeah. So, so okay. Uh, sorry about that. But um, Abimelech so this, he's is he one of the 70 i would say he is separate from the 70 yeah so he would be one that's not really counted so this concubine in shechem he didn't take into his own house right which he would normally would do um so i'm not sure why that is doesn't give us a lot to go on well it's also interesting to me that this name occurs four times within scripture. You have two Philistines and two Israelites that are named Abimelech. Yeah. Yeah, my father is king. Is it my father is king or that this is the father of the king? No, my father's king. Okay. So that which is offered within uh, Strong's would be incorrect. That's interesting. Well, Strong's is often incorrect, if that's what you're asking. As to this on, the, on this name, I'm just saying that's interesting. Yeah. 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 So uh, Drown, Brown Drivers Briggs has, my father is king. Because um, that would be correct. That's what it actually does mean. Okay. Because it says Abi, which means my father. And Melek, king. So my father is king, is how you translate it. Okay. Now, the first time that we find Abimelech within scripture is when Abraham and Sarah are before the uh, before Abimelech the king of Gerar. Yeah, Genesis 20. Yeah, because he's he's basically saying Sarah is my sister, which is not a complete untruth, but it's not a complete truth either. Yeah. So Genesis 20 had quite a bit to teach us on that situation. And then we have in Genesis 21 that Abimelech and Phicol, the chief captain of his host, come to him regarding the situation with these wells, right? Mm -hmm. But specifically, which well are we talking about? Uh, isn't the well of the oath? Yes. Yeah. And they made a covenant regarding the well of the oath. Yes, yeah, so that's Beersheba. Right. And then you have Isaac, who runs into an Abimelech, who's also the king of the Philistines in Gerar. And he also has a general Phicol, but these wouldn't be the same people. Right. So that these, these names are descriptions rather than, say, given names. Right. So... After Genesis 26, we then come into this for the third time with Abimelech 
being mentioned. And we're going to get quite a bit into the story of, of Abimelech here within Judges 9. The fourth time we come to Abimelech, And I'm, I'm scrolling through this right now. Comes up in 1 Chronicles 18, 16. Mm -hmm. Where we have Zadok, the son of Ahitub, and Abimelech, the son of Abiathar, were the priests. So, We've gone through two Philistines, one son of Gideon, and then we come to an Abimelech that were priests before the Lord. Yeah, well, in 2 Samuel 11, 21. Um, right, but that's just, that, that's a description of the Abimelech we're discussing right now, the third okay. Abimelech. Okay. Yeah, which is interesting. Uh, I'm just in that one because um, it calls him the son of Jerob Shesh, right? So instead of Jerob Baal, they put um, Jerubasheth. Jerubasheth, uh, because, and they do the same thing with another name, uh, one of the sons of Saul, uh, because Sheth just means shame. So instead of using the name Baal, they put shame there. So it's the same person. Jerob Baal is called Jerob Sheth. And he's, he's, he is saying that, that Abimelech is the son of shame? The son of, of Jerob Sheth. Jerubasheth, yes. Jerubasheth, yeah. Yeah, shame. And contend. Uh, instead of Baal will contend, it's shame will contend. So it's just, it's just an interesting note about putting Sheth in a name. It replaces Baal. Okay. So we have Gideon's concubine living in Shechem, who bears him a son, which he called Abimelech. And Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age and was buried in the sepulcher of Joash, his father, in Ophrah, of the Abizarites. But we're not told how old Gideon was. We're not given the chronology on Gideon. We're just told that he died at a good old age. He was not buried in Shechem. He was buried where he lived in Ophrah. Mm -hmm. What else can we see here? We know that there had been 40 years of peace. So Gideon was at, at a, quote, good old age after 40 years of peace that he brought on this portion of Israel. Mm -hmm. So, as we are comparing other portions of scripture, at a good old age, we have that Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good age, good old age, an old man full of years, and was gathered unto his people in Genesis 25, 8. And then we also have Job 5, 26, thou shalt come to thy grave in a full age. Like as a shock of corn cometh in its season. So 
So we can assume that Gideon was an old man at the time that he died. Now, Judges 8.33, and it came to pass as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel turned again and went a whoring after Balaam and made Baal Bereth their God. Literally, Baal Bereth, meaning the Lord of the Covenant. Why would they want to serve or seek to enter into a covenant with that which was not of God? Were they looking? Uh, so, sorry, as soon as Gideon was dead. So, in other words, they were focusing on him. And just as Theodore and you were talking about, they focused on man. They made man their god in a sense. And so, as soon as their former god was dead, they went to another god. They didn't have the foundation in Christ that everybody needs. Right. Now. As you said earlier, Theodore, is this human nature that led to this? Or is it just that we have, we have become so used to following in the steps of the adversary that we're not willing to make the decision for what, what we really need to be doing? Well, you know, uh, you know, we're trying to make an application of this to the movement. Right. We know that this is connected to the July 18th prediction. Correct. And FFA, of course, let out in the July 18th prediction. Right. Even though I came up with the date, I definitely wasn't leading out in, in that prediction. Um, was hardly even a part of it. But, um, you know, after FFA ended... Um, the movement was kind of lost. There were a lot of questions. Why are we here? Yeah. And, you know, the question is, uh, you know, how would we apply this? I mean, would we apply it to the movement, you know, afterwards, the movement during, you know, how would we apply this message of Gideon? I mean, Jeff did apply it to the July 18 prediction. And, and I don't think he was wrong. No, I think he was spot on. Yeah. So, so if we could take the death of Gideon as somehow representing uh, the end of FFA, then if we're going to take this um, ephod, what would the ephod represent? I mean, it represents something of the message of FFA. Would it be the, because it can't be the structure because the structure doesn't survive. Right. And, you know, so that's, that's the thing is we have lots in this story of Gideon and a lot of it we would have to take as repeat and enlarge because, you know, we're going to get the story of Abimelech then and how would we apply that? And remember, we're not applying this to individuals, to people. These are messages. Um. Is there some mistake that FFA made that we could parallel with the EFOD? Um, if I look at a mistake, from my perspective, my understanding of the mistake that was made was how people were treated when they were perceived as heretics. You know, maybe that's just a bias of mine, but but I saw that there were people that were treated as heretics, and they weren't treated in what I would call the correct manner. That is, they were misrepresented, often because of gossip that came to Jeff, and Jeff trusted the source of the information that he was receiving, when often it was, it was not correct about different individuals. 
and he acted on that and that happened for a lot of years it wasn't just at the end i mean it happened earlier even with people like mark bruce even though mark bruce had problems a lot of the stories uh, that came from mark bruce were also distorted and even mark bruce distorted stories that he gave to jeff about uh path of the just and so forth so all through the time that i've been in the movement i would see that people were in my view mistreated even though they were in error um it doesn't mean that you treat someone that way it, it doesn't benefit the individual but it also doesn't benefit the movement so you know that's just my understanding of of what i saw but that that sort of has carried on as a spirit within this movement and i don't think the movement has ever benefited by misrepresenting people shutting people out censuring people i don't think it benefited in the time when jeff was in charge of the movement or even afterwards One thing I wanted to mention about the ephod too, it was it was a priestly apron. And when mm. I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking about when Jesus in, in John 13 gird himself with a towel. In other words, he was like assuming an apron, illustrating what a servant is supposed to be mm. by his actions of washing their feet and teaching them to humble themselves and regard each other as equal brethren. And you're right. I mean, I've seen this in the movement too. And after people in the movement listen to my comments during these presentations, I'm sure I'm going to get some flack. I'd be very surprised if I didn't, but I have to follow God. I have to, I mean, I know I often say things that are not correct, but everybody who knows me, who knows me in the right spirit knows I'm seeking the Lord, right? I want to be with Jesus eternally, and I want to be a benefit to this movement and wherever I can be a benefit. So I'm going to continue speaking out. But I think servanthood is uh, something we need to remember. We are nothing except Christ is sustaining us. We need to recognize that there is no superiority. There is no inferiority among us. We all have gifts. We need to recognize those gifts. And we need to realize they're from God. And we can't exalt ourselves because of those gifts. And I, and I agree there. It has been too much focus on certain individuals because of their gifts. And I get alarmed when a certain person who is now being exalted and promoted sends me something that I regard as new age. It's occultic and I don't want to return to that world. So I deleted it. I am not going to sign on to this stuff. Well, and so, I mean, it's, I agree with your point there. And the, I mean, the danger of exalting man, I mean, is twofold. It's dangerous to the man um, because it never, it never helps that person. And, and it's dangerous to the individual who exalts the man. And Ellen White makes a statement. uh, I I don't know if I know it word for word, but basically um, when, when people look to men, to some leader, to some preacher, God removes the wisdom from that person. So a person may have had light and and wisdom, but when that person's put in the place of God, God removes that wisdom. And I've seen that with people like Doug Batchelor, who I believe started out correctly. But he got exalted, and when he became exalted, he trusted in his own wisdom rather than that of God. And And we can have the example. Herod, who was eaten by worms in the book of Acts because of all the adulation and the self-worship and other worship. There's such a danger in that. Yeah. Well, just because somebody's been given light once doesn't mean that that person now is a source of light. You know, God is the source of light. God chooses to meet an individual. Yeah. So he's going to choose, you know, somebody to have to give light through but that doesn't mean then you look to that person for light because god will then choose someone else 
he chooses the weak things of the world to confound the wise. So that so that's the great danger. But then also when we decide that we're the ones who can judge, then and we start shutting it down other people because they don't agree with us or our sentiments or our ideas or opinions, then we're in really grave danger. And and I think that the church has done that, the movement has done that. You know, it was done in FFA, and it's still being done. And God is not served by that. The truth is not served. Well, we got a few minutes. Can we finish off this chapter? We're going to. Okay. And the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God, who had delivered them out of the hands of the enemies of all their enemies on every side. So my question here in regard to this verse, can we make the application that the children of Israel not remembering the Lord is can be applied to those that are choosing to set aside Miller's rules. Because it is by Miller's rules that we are delivered from the enemies on every side. And the enemies are these false, these are the enemies that are left to prove or test us. So these are Correct. the winds of doctrine. Right. Could we make that application? Well, I think we have to make that application. And whether you want to characterize it just plainly as Miller's rules, which I have no problem doing. Um, but we can see that it, it manifests itself in many different ways. Well, in, in a manner of speaking, isn't Miller's rules a type of message? Yeah. But people can, can claim to be using Miller's rules. Right. And not be using Miller's rules. Just like they can be claim, claiming to use the charts and not be really using the charts. Yeah. And so when they don't show, they sh neither show the kindness to the house of Jeroboam, namely Gideon, I would think that this is a rejection of a message. Right. Right. So that means there's the message of Gideon, which I think is the message of July 18, um, that they attack that message. Well, the message of July 18th, is it not a warning? Very much like the name Methuselah was a warning. Well, it's definitely a warning, um, but it's also tied to so many things. It's I, I agree. Right. It, 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 it there's no way that you can attack the July 18 and hold on to Adventism as far as I'm concerned. Once you understand July 18, if you attack it, you, you're attacking the foundation of Adventism. Right. This Jeff was really clear on this, that everything that he had ever studied led to the July 18 prediction. And, you know, he knew that it came from God. Agreed. Yeah. It's the only place it could have come from. Yeah, it definitely couldn't have come from man. It wasn't... You know, that's why, you know, I'm, I'm still working on putting together a book where I go through and um, describe the development of this message all the way from Millerite history and onward. And, and the thing that's about July 18 is that we didn't reverse engineer it. We didn't come up with July 18 and come up with all these reasons why it was correct. All of these truths unfolded naturally to lead to the July 18, 2020 prediction. Right. And somebody looking at from the outside can't necessarily see that. They wouldn't see it. Yeah. Because they would not have been looking at this through the lens and the light that had been provided. Yeah. Because it just unfolded naturally. It was quite amazing to, to witness. 
So, so I think that this is talking about a reje rejection of July 18. Okay. And now the ephod leads to that. So the ephod is some remnant from FFA or the movement or whatever that leads finally to people rejecting uh, the message itself. Right. Because they've made a covenant with Baal. So neither showed they kindness to the house of Jerubal, namely Gideon, according to all the goodness that he had showed unto Israel. Neither showed they kindness to FFA, to the movement, according to all of the goodness which the movement had shown unto Israel. Would that be an incorrect application? Say it again. If we apply the house of Jerubal, namely Gideon, to the movement. Okay. Neither showed they kindness unto the movement, according to all of the goodness that the movement had shown unto Israel. Well, see, I wouldn't put the movement. I would put it as the message of July 18. Okay. That's the way I would put it. I wouldn't say the movement. Okay. Is there any other thoughts on what we have been covering today? Our time is now at an end. Shall we close with prayer? Yeah. Gracious Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you are providing us, especially providing us with a message so that we may wake up and be prepared for that which is to come. Be with each one of us today. I thank you for those that have been in this meeting, for those that have participated, for those that have listened, and for those that will listen later. Direct us now as we prepare for the events that you would have us to undertake today. Show us that that we should do to bring glory to your name, to bring glory to your character. Thank you, Father, for these opportunities. I thank you for each one that has attended. For this, Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.